why will Africa make you a better wildlife photographer? Let's find out. Hi folks, welcome back to my channel. Thank you for joining me. If you're new here, welcome. Please don't forget to hit that subscribe button and hit that bell icon so that you're always notified whenever I post new content. My name is Shane James, I'm a wildlife photographer and a professional wildlife hide designer in India. So when we think of the word safari, there are two places that come to mind instantly. One being Africa and the other being India. As an Indian wildlife photographer, I obviously enjoy my life job in India, whether it's down south in Western Ghats, in southern Tamil Nadu to Karnataka, all the way up to Corbett uh, in North India or Kaziranga in the northeast, down across to the west in the little run of Kutch in Gujarat. So there's an absolute plethora of opportunities and places to visit and enjoy wildlife photography in India. So then why am I talking about Africa being better for you as a wildlife photographer? So the first thing I need to say that when I'm talking about why Africa would make you a better wildlife photographer, I'm pitching this purely at novices and enthusiasts. Because if you're a professional wildlife photographer, you're an expert, you can make the most of pretty much any situation that you're thrown into. However, that's not always the case for someone who's just beginning in wildlife photography or someone who's still kind of getting to grips with and wants to experiment. So if, uh, when I'm talking about Africa being better for you as a wildlife photographer, this is no way to put, uh, to cast shade on the wildlife photography opportunities in India. So I need to make that very clear straight off the bat because being Indian, I love my wildlife photography here in India. However, I'm looking at this from the viewpoint of how you as a wildlife photographer would want to make the most of opportunities that help you. So if I'm talking about uh, Africa here, I want to make a comparison as an Indian wildlife photographer to situations that we would face here in India or scenarios that we would have in India. So when we look at Africa, we dominantly talk about East Africa, so this would be uh, say the Maasai Mara in Kenya, or the Serengeti in Tutu in uh, uh, Tanzania. So East Africa versus India. So the, the first thing that we have to understand is that there is a difference in the context. We have to understand what is a safari in an Indian context and what is safari in an East African context. As, as in, what is the setup? What is the nature of the ecosystem? How are safaris conducted? Uh, how does the nature of that ecosystem play into opportunities that you have? So that's what we're going to look at. So the very first thing that we need to look at when we talk about wildlife uh, safari opportunities in India is in India it is predominantly forests. That's what you're looking at. Now, granted, there are other places that are some grasslands and, and uh, other places where you can also engage in wildlife photography. But when we talk about wildlife uh, safaris, we are predominantly talking about uh, safari opportunities for big cats like tigers. So we talk about tiger safaris or, uh, as a sort of uh, generic uh, marker. India, whether it's rainforests in the south, we talk about dry deciduous forests or evergreen forests in the north and the northeast, it's all predominantly forest environments. So what happens in the forest environment? As you can see from this image, this is taken from in Kabini in uh, South India. You can see the scale of the elephants against the forest. It's to show you the density of the forest. So when you look at that, you can kind of understand just how much of light gets in through a forest. One, because obviously being a photographer, light is very important. Two, how does that uh, play into opportunities to sight and then photograph wildlife? So the next, the video that you're looking at here was taken in Corbett, so which is in the north of India. But again, this is a forest environment, and you can see just how dense the forest is, and 
how little light comes through. Now, remember that as a wildlife photographer, you're shooting primarily early hours in the morning and then uh, in the evening. And, we, and the best condition that you're looking for is that golden hour. So that's when the light, when the sun is really low on the horizon, uh, just after sunrise or just before sunset. And you have this fantastic, beautiful, delicious golden light coming through. But in India, because of the forests, you're going to have very little of the golden light coming through because the forests are going to be blocking the light, number one. Uh, so number two, it also means that you, when you have opportunities, you're cranking your ISO up a lot to compensate for that. The other thing that happens is when you are looking uh, for opportunities in a forest, Look at this video. This is also from Corbett, and I had taken this in uh, March, uh, in February this year. You can tell that this is a, a pretty dense environment, but it's that dense that you can't actually spot this elephant until you pass it right on the edge of the road. That's how dense the uh, environment is, so, which means you don't get to see an animal unless and until it exits that tree line. And when it exits that tree line, you're on a narrow path or a road, and you have uh, only that time that it takes for the in this case an elephant, or whether it's a tiger or, or a leopard, to cross the road. So look at this image. This is from Kavini again. You can see how dense the undergrowth is that even an animal like a tiger is partly hidden. So till it actually exits that undergrowth and comes out, and when they do, this is most likely the situation that you're going to have. You're going to have an animal that bolts across the track. So when the animal exits the tree line and crosses the track, you have a few seconds or a few moments in which to capture the image. And if you're the first vehicle or you're, you're, you have a clear line of sight, that's well and good. But if you don't, if you're stuck behind another vehicle, how do you make the most of that opportunity? So this is the Indian context. Now compare that with the East African context of the grassland, of the savannah. Now this is what you're looking at. You're looking at an open grassland all the way to the horizon, which means that you have a clear line of sight across. Uh, so it's so much easier to spot animals. So what does it also mean that apart from being able to sight animals, is that you have this, you have fantastic light right in the early hours of the morning, right from sunrise through to sunset at the horizon, giving you beautiful opportunities to make the most golden light. So whether it's shooting uh, backlit images, rimlet images, shooting videos like this of, or of a lion and golden light, it's just absolutely what you want to engage in as a wildlife photographer, is to make the most of those sort of moments because the light is fleeting, the light is it's going to last you only for about 15, 20 minutes uh, before it becomes just normal light. So this makes a world of difference. Uh, the context uh, of what photographic opportunities are because of the forest environment in India versus a savanna or the grassland environment in Africa. But the second aspect is because of the nature of the ecosystem, the way safaris are conducted are very different. So what I would consider this uh, being a rat race versus doing things at your own pace. When we think about wildlife photography and you know being, uh, you want to be on the scene to, to make the most of, of that opportunity, it's not just being the first on the scene when you see a tiger or a leopard or an elephant or whatever it is. The actual race starts before the safari even begins. So you're at the gate. In this image, you're at, people are queuing up to be at the gate to be first. Why? Because you're on a single track, or sometimes there's two vehicles abreast. But it, it's a narrow track, which means that the first vehicle or the second, maybe the first three or four vehicles, may have a clear line of sight. Beyond that, the animals, uh, the vehicles that are behind, are always going to be shooting between the vehicles in front or over the heads of the people who are standing in front, which means it's not the best photographic opportunities. So the onus is on you to get to the gate 
as fast as possible. So it's literally a race to be first in line because in India, at the different uh, uh, parks, you have different gates and the gates don't open till a particular time. As you can see here, there's a guard, forest guard, and there's a boom barrier. So it's only at that prescribed time that they open the gate. And once the gate opens, you are bound to follow the vehicle at the back unless there's space for you to overtake. And usually that chance doesn't occur because people pretty much race through. So even if you're the eighth or tenth vehicle in line and you're choking on dust, you can't hang back because of the dust. Because if you turn up late and the first few vehicles see a tiger, the tiger may not might, might get spooked and might cross the road and that's it. You've lost the opportunity. So you need to be there first. So this video is an example of that. This was in uh, Ranthambur and this is at zone 3. So you can see we, we were the second vehicle to enter. And as soon as we entered, we had to stop. Though the gate was open because we had a tiger literally 50 meters from the gate. Which means the vehicles behind, the ones that are still outside the gate, because they can't see it, There's, this is actually an old fort kind of a gate. Um, they know there's action. They know there's a tiger there. But they can't even see it. So it's only the first few vehicles that had the opportunity to enjoy this moment. Driving into zone 3, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, the gate opens. We're at the gate, so that's the gate right behind us. And this is the scene. Sometimes it's not just about being first in line. It could be just being about being first to get to a spot. This is also in Ranthambur. And here, you know, I'm stuck in the middle of the pack and the pace is being dictated by the vehicle in front because they're trying to keep pace with the tigers as the tigers are walking. Uh, so all that I'm getting to see is the tiger's butts from behind. It's not a great photographic opportunity, but there's nothing you can do. But you can actually see there are vehicles trying to kind of get a peak and trying to overtake, but there's nothing you can do. So being first on the scene is paramount because that means you're going to get the best opportunities. Uh, how does the same sort of situation play out in Africa? This is a shot I've taken from uh, my bush plane just as it's landing in the Masai Mara. So the first thing that you see, again, as I mentioned before, this is an open grassland and whatever you see here uh, in terms of uh, the dark green patches is uh, strips of riverine forest along, I think in this case, this is the Dalek River. And all of the white strips, the pale strips that you see are the different paths that vehicles could take. Now the difference between the gate system in India and Africa is here the gate system is just an entry point. This is not where your safari necessarily begins. This is just your entry into that region of the Masai Mara, that region of the Serengeti. Uh, so there's no queuing up to, to uh, or be in a rush to beat the uh, vehicle in front of you. It's a very children process. This is basically where they check your permits and say, yep, you're authorized, you're allowed to go in. That's it. Because all, all of the camps and lodges are primarily in the wild, in the Masai Mara or in the Serengeti. You're not driving outside unless you're in a conservancy. And once you get in there, there are multiple paths to take, so you can take any path and drive. In terms of wildlife viewing, this is the sort of opportunities that it, it gives you. Because you have vehicles that spread out across the region and they're not all concentrated in one road. So in this case, it's a pair of bull elephants in Tutu in Tanzania. And uh, it was magical to have these elephants walk right up to us. So we were two or three vehicles in our group. And we were the only ones there that had this opportunity. And we didn't have to worry about anybody else cutting in front or someone ruining our shot. And it also gives you the opportunity to play with uh, your gear. So I was able to make multiple, we all made multiple images. And this was with a ultra wide angle. This was shot at 11 to 16 mm. So that'll tell you just how close these animals were. We were literally about three to four meters away from the vehicle. That's it. That, that's how close they got. Because the animals aren't stressed out either. They're really relaxed and chilled out. So not having uh, to rush to a particular location or not having to follow someone gives you so much more freedom uh, and takes the stress off you. 
And as a wildlife photographer, that's exactly the sort of op- uh, conditions under which you want to operate, you know, without having to panic about being there first. The third aspect that I want to talk about was how animals are located. In India, it's a process that's by sound, and in Africa, it's by sight. So what do I mean by sound? As I explained before, um, it's a system of forests. You have low visibility beyond the tree line. You don't know where, as I, as I, as you saw with the uh, video of the elephant, you don't even know if there's an elephant right there or a big cat like a tiger or a, or a leopard. Um, but the ones that do invariably know are prey, whether they're uh, deer like cheetah or sambar or monkeys like the langur or the tags. Invariably, whenever a predator moves through the forest, its movement can be tracked by the alarm calls that are given by prey species. And that's what the naturalists use uh, in India. So it's a, uh, you would get to a junction, switch the vehicle off, and just listen. And the moment they hear an alarm call, they wait for the second alarm call because that would tell you which direction the animal is moving in. So you would know, is it moving left to right, right to left? Is it getting closer, moving further away? And then comes this mental mapping of, okay, there's a track that goes around the other side that would intersect on, uh, that would intersect the path of the predator. And so immediately you drive around to get to the other side to what I would call the alarm call ambush, because basically you're ambushing the predator uh, by listening to alarm calls to get to a spot and hopefully it comes out and then you're able to make images. But there's no, it's a very exciting process because uh, there's a lot of mystery in it. There's a lot of uh, uh, excitement, you know, to hear an alarm call and then to try to kind of extrapolate which way uh, the animal is moving and then decide what you want to do. Uh, so it's very exciting. But it's also not a guaranteed process because an animal could be moving and then it could decide to stop. Uh, or it may not, it may change direction. So the alarm call system is exciting. But it means that you have to, it's, it's basically a roll of the dice. And when, it, when you have that opportunity, when the um, predator crosses or comes out into the open, into a patch of, of uh, open landscape, it's amazing because then, you know, your, your uh, plan paid off and then you have the opportunity to make images. But sometimes even that doesn't always work out, as in this image. The leopard walked out of the forest. Unfortunately, because the vehicles were staggered, it's walked between the vehicles, which means for me, the shot is ruined because I've got animals, but I've got vehicles behind the animal, and I'm ruining their shot as well because my vehicle is behind the leopard for them. And also, you have to look, this uh, particular image isn't exactly the best because look at the lighting, but I'm not in control of the lighting here. So that's the other problem with this. You can't choose a direction. You have to go where the animal, where you think the animal is going to appear. Uh, you can't angle your vehicle anyway because you will be blocking others. It's a narrow path. You can't choose the direction uh, according to you know whether it's you shooting with the light or against the light. You have to play the hand that you're dealt with, and that isn't always the best of the uh, best opportunity for you. You just have to make the most of it. So if it's really great light, fantastic. But if it's not, if it's an opportunity like this, it's more of a record shot. Now compare that with Africa, where we're talking about the savannas, the open grasslands. Because it's open, everything is about line of sight. You can see clear across to the horizon, which means when you have animal movement, it's easy to see the animal movement and then choose your track and then drive around and get there. Or in places like like this in, in Dutu, you don't even have to worry about uh, following a track because Dutu is a place that you're allowed to off-road, which means if you see something by line of sight, you can take the shortest route right across the landscape to get there. And it also means that you can choose what distance you 
keep from the animal if you choose if you're shooting to do uh, you know shoot with your super telephoto lens you want to be a little further back you want to shoot wide angle images you can get closer you don't like the light you can change your position uh, you want to wait till the animal moves towards you you have so many options because you're in control uh, we found this lioness it was literally because our guide said I think there's a lion on that rock there were no other vehicles around so we um, we didn't see a, you know a, a group of vehicles there and then decide oh there must be something happening it's just that our guide was scanning the horizon he said I think there's a lion on that rock and as we drove up right enough there was a lioness a single alone lioness in the middle of the Serengeti on this rock and it was just our group that had the opportunity to shoot these uh, images and shoot some video. So this gives you a very different experience. Yes, it doesn't have the same excitement that you would have in India of sort of uh, doing a bit of detective work and, and listening to the calls and extrapolating. But as a wildlife photographer, in terms of photographic opportunities, you want to be able to get to that scene as quick as possible because there could be some sort of behavior that's happening or uh, it could be a hunting opportunity or, or mating or anything like that where you want to be able to take the shot and therefore you need to get there as quick as possible. So being able to spot something in the distance and then make a beeline for it makes all the difference to being able to uh, get the shot that you want or miss the shot. Coming to the fourth aspect. Now, there's no doubt that everybody, whether whether you're in India or whether you're in Africa, you want to shoot. You know, in, in India, you have big ticket items like tigers or leopards or elephants and bears or rhinos if you're in Kaziranga. Um, so in Africa, it's, it's the big five. But the fact is that there's a whole lot more happening. There are so many other animals and birds and reptiles that make up the wildlife experience that we don't always focus on. And one of the things that happens in, in India, if, if you go especially to the tiger reserves, that the naturalists are keen to show you tigers, which is great because that's why you went to a tiger reserve. But what it also means is that people don't end up stopping for something that would be less than a tiger. Now, if you go to Kabini, for example, if you said you saw a tiger, that's great. But then the tiger is not the star animal in Kabini. In Kabini, the star animal is the black panther. So it's like, you saw a tiger, oh, that's nice. But did you see the black panther? So, you know, it's, it's a very different uh, experience to go to a place like Kabini and find that a tiger, oh, a tiger is nice. But, you know, still not the best uh, sighting experience. This opportunity that I had in Bandhavgar, I had never seen an Indian sloth bear before. Uh, this is this image was a few years ago, and um, when we drove in through the gate, we were the second vehicle, and the first vehicle had stopped because there was a sloth bear at a termite mound, and I was all primed to take images of the sloth bear. But the driver just slowed down to get past the other vehicle, and just kept driving past. And luckily, I had my camera out, and I squeezed off a couple of shots, and this was one of them. It's, it's a bad image. It's, there's nothing good about this image at all. But this is the only image that I have of an Indian sloth bear to date. And when I asked, you know, I said, look, why aren't we stopping? And uh, his first thing was, no, sir, tiger. And everyone else was like, yeah, tiger, tiger. And so I was the only one who wanted to shoot the sloth bear because there was an opportunity to shoot the sloth bear. But... Um, it's just the mentality that people have that the tiger comes first and everything else comes second. Now, if you compare that with Africa, and this is where I find that there's, there's a vast difference, is that if you see some movement and you ask the guy, what is that? They would stop and they would look. And in this case, we saw some movement uh, in the grass and it turned out to be this pack of banded mongoose um, that were playing, playing around and they were moving, I think, from, maybe from one den to another. And the driver is happy, the, the guide is happy to stop and explain, you know, as to what's happening and, and let you take images uh, because they don't feel the pressure to show you only the big five. Or, or, you know, that you, unless you've specifically told them that I don't want to stop for anything other than leopards or cheetahs or whatever it is, uh, 
be happy to show you anything. Well, in this case, this is in Goro Goro, and this is a, a lock. I think it's a push lock. I could be wrong. And it was singing, and it was just by the side of the track. So the opportunity to make some video of the uh, of the behavior, to shoot some images, and if you don't know what that is, and the guide doesn't know either, they are more than happy to immediately whip out their guidebook, uh, uh, their bird guidebook, and flip through and try to immediately find what animal that is because for them it's an opportunity to also brush up on their knowledge and add another layer of knowledge the fifth aspect skills versus opportunities now let me make this very clear as someone who's photographed in both done wildlife photography in india as well as in africa you have to be a far better wildlife photographer in india to make images then you have to be in Africa. Africa is very, very forgiving. And you have so many more opportunities. In India, the opportunities are lesser because, as we said, this is the forest animals have to come out of the tree line, be out in the open. And when you do, you've got 15, 20 other vehicles competing. You're shooting between uh, vehicles to, to try to get shots, which means that you have to be on the money. From the moment you enter the park, you have to make sure that your settings are dialed in, you know what you want to get, you have to be able to make changes on the fly, you have to uh, decide when you want to drop your uh, uh, te super telephoto lens, switch to a wide angle lens, because you have just a very narrow window of opportunity in which to make those images before the animal may move. So, this, for example, you know, it was a Rantham board. And as you can see, I'm shooting, I'm trying to shoot this uh, tiger cup. And just as I've composed it, the vehicle in front, the guy leaned out and he tried to get an image of his own. I can't blame him because he was trying to get his image. But this is the sort of issue that you have to deal with. So immediately I had to switch on the fly, change my composition, uh, because the cup got up having seen that movement and then it moved. As it moved, it walked across the bottle and then it splashed up this water. Now, had I kept the same composition, I would have most likely got the guy on the left again. So I had to change my uh, orientation and switch to the portrait orientation to capture this image. So you have to be on the ball. When people make images in India and they're good images, trust me, what you're not seeing is all of the other sort of things that they would have had to avoid to be able to get that image. So you have to be a far better wildlife photographer to make good images in India, then you have to be in Africa. In Africa, it's very, very forgiving. Uh, sometimes you, you've you got your settings wrong, uh, you've accidentally switched to manual focus, and then you know the animal's moving and you're not able to get focus, and then you realize and that's okay. You just wait a couple of moments and you have the opportunity again. This lion, for example, we accompanied this line when it walked for almost five kilometers and it gave us so many opportunities to shoot with different backgrounds with different folk lengths capturing different behavior like in this case where it's uh, scent marking the bushes we were able to drive ahead find a spot where we were lower than the track that the animal was moving on because it was just moving on one straight line so then we could get this tree line we could get the sky but we could move ahead and wait for it to come towards us to get head-on images. It's just so many opportunities. So we're talking about one subject that we spent time with, and it just gave us so many opportunities. And if you go at a time, uh, for example, say during the Great Migration and you have the river crossings, it's just bonkers because you have so many opportunities uh, to indulge in, in not just different um, sort of styles of image but also in different techniques like you might want to shoot ultra wide you might want to shoot uh, slow shutter panning images uh, you might want to freeze the action you get absolutely you know amazing moments when the wildebeest jump off the cliff and head down into the water you can make really moody images so the opportunities are there but the fact is you might end up doing you know the same image over and over again but the opportunities it gives are just amazing. So you can shoot to your heart's content and think, okay, I've done this. What else can I do? Then pick up a wide-angle lens or 
or switch to a, a, a medium telephoto lens, or maybe you just shoot some video, whatever it is, you have the time. And that gives you the opportunity to explore your photographic uh, bandwidth. So the last question would then be, when should you go to Africa? Should you go when you're a novice? Should you go when you're an enthusiast? Or is it only for experts? For me, I have found that in my journey, when I started as a novice through to an, uh, being an enthusiast, and I've seen right up to the pros who I uh, see there every, every year when I go, you have some of the world's best photographers out there. Africa treats you the same. It gives you opportunities to absolutely immerse yourself in photographic opportunities that you would not have otherwise. Um, especially starting with, like I said, golden light. To get that kind of light in the morning, early hours in the morning or late in the evening, uh, it's just magical to be able to indulge in that level of photography and to be able to make images that you have only ever seen you know, on, on some of the world's best publications or, or on Instagram, or some of the world's best photographers, and you're like, wow, I can make that image. And that's time, that type of image. And why? It's just because you have the opportunity to enjoy the same sort of uh, environment that they uh, shoot in, right? So Africa is a great leveling field in that sense because it gives you the same opportunity. What you do with that opportunity is up to you. So it's not just uh, the golden light, it's also opportunities to take silhouettes. It's the opportunity to make Im images in the blue hour. That's that uh, hour just before sunrise, it's the time before sunrise, and it's the time just after sunset when you have these beautiful deep blues in the sky. Play with slow shutter panning images and rim lighting. Professionals would go out there or the experts would go out there with a bucket list saying, I want to make a primlet image of a male lion yawning. And they would try to find a, a lion and stay with it. Right? They would ignore everything else. But that's because they've got that focus. As a novice, if you don't necessarily have that, I want to do X, Y, or Z, enjoy the photographic opportunities. After a couple of days, if you said, okay, now I want to try this, I want to do that, make a list, share it with your guide and say, I want to do this. I want to be able to take a photograph of a silhouette of a lion or a cheetah or whatever it is or maybe it's giraffes so you have those opportunities and you have the time and the bandwidth to be able to plan them and then try to make them work and one of the other things which i haven't personally tried myself in africa uh, but if you have the opportunity to do that is to uh, enjoy a hot air balloon ride over the masai mara or over the serengeti Obviously, you're not shooting with a bigger lens at that time. You might be shooting with a wide-angle lens or a 70-200. But just the opportunities to be able to do that. Um, and that's usually, again, at sunrise, just before sunrise, or just before sunset. So you can imagine how fantastic it would be to be in a hot air balloon over the landscape and to be able to shoot images of wildlife from an absolutely unique perspective. So there are so many reasons why you would want to go as a novice, you would want to go as an enthusiast, and you would want to go as a professional. Because every time you go back, you keep discovering more and more opportunities. Lessons that you've learned from Africa that you can bring in and apply in India. And I think that goes a long way in to making you a better wildlife photographer. So it's a great classroom, is what I would call it. You know, just, just the kind of things that you could experiment with. All of it on one trip. So, in my opinion, spending a week, five days to a week, in the Masai Mara or on the Serengeti or Amboseli or, or Tutu, wherever it is in, 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 these, in East Africa, will give you so much more back because of the sheer volume of opportunities in terms of being able to develop your skills. And this is something that is critical in your path to becoming a better wildlife photographer. For me, Africa accelerates that process. And I think 
as a wildlife photographer, you want to make the most of every opportunity that accelerates your growth as a wildlife photographer. And this is why I believe that Africa will make you a better wildlife photographer. I hope you guys enjoyed this video and I look forward to seeing you guys in the next one. And uh, until then, please stay safe, stay home, uh, sanitize your hands, maintain social distancing, and may the focus be with you.